Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Juno Dawson, author of the new novel, Her Majesty's Royal Coven. Juno is a best-selling novelist, screenwriter, journalist, and a columnist for Attitude Magazine. She also writes for television and has multiple shows in development both in the UK and US. Her debut short film was The Birth of Venus, and she created the first official Doctor Who scripted podcast, Doctor Who Redacted. Juno, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. What a lovely introduction. Sure. Well, if someone listening hasn't yet heard about your novel, Her Majesty's Royal Coven, how would you describe the novel? It is the first part of a fantasy trilogy, um, but kind of set in a fantasy that's very, very similar to our world. It concerns five witches who've been friends since they were adolescents, and we join them 25 years on when an apocalyptic prophecy brings them back together. But the problem is these women have very different views on how they should tackle this prophecy. And I'm curious, do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to write Her Majesty's Royal Coven? I can tell you exactly where I was, (laughs) Jess. I was in a hotel room in Melbourne in Australia. I was touring one of my young adult novels, a book called Clean, and I had horrific jet lag and couldn't sleep. And I don't know why this idea popped into my head. And by this point, I had sort of started to think about if I was ever going to write a book for adults, what would it be? And the very first seedling of the idea was Desperate Housewives, but witches. (laughs) And then I know that novel exists. It's called Witches of Eastwick, and it's very famous. But I did. I got out of bed and I just wrote down some notes on my laptop. I right away I knew I wanted to set the story in Hebden Bridge, which is a real place not far from where I grew up in Yorkshire. And I just kind of jotted down, I guess, the archetypes of what would become the characters. I knew one of them would be a career woman. I knew one of them would be a housewife. I knew one of them would be a rebel. And I knew that one of them, well, I knew that two of them were going to be identical twins and they were going to come with this history. And then it just sat on my laptop for two years <laughs> and I did nothing with it. It, you know, it really didn't enter my head. But then we went into lockdown in 2020 and I was supposed to be working on a YA thriller. I was contracted to have another YA book out, but it just wasn't coming. Like everyone, I was feeling very anxious and obviously that's not very creatively fruitful. Mm-hmm. And um, my husband just said, you know, if you could write anything in the world, and you don't worry about your contract, don't worry about your readers, you know, just what would you write for you? And I was like, I want to write like the Spice Girls, but they're witches in kind of like an X-Men universe. And he was like, right, well, then you do that. You do your Spice Girl X-Men witches. Off you go. And the rest is history. You know, from then on, from that point, I started to think about the coven and the, the world around these women and, you know, Six months later, I had a really big, long novel. That's great. Uh, I'm curious, um, what was your motivation to tackle real-life issues such as gender and power and transphobia in a fantasy trilogy? Yeah, so I think, you know, I'm a transgender woman living in the UK, which is a rainy little island with a very transphobic mainstream media. And I can't shut that out. You know, any artist is a product of the environment they're creating in. And I was no different, Um, you know, especially when we were all locked in our houses. I was just confronted by a lot of stuff online, a lot of Mm -hmm. really heavy stuff. Now, I could not write a book like Sean Fay's The Transgender Issue, which is just a seminal text exploring the current state of trans people politically. I just couldn't do it. It's not my skill set. Um, I, I can't remain calm and impartial in the way that she does in that book. And so I did find myself with lots of concerns and questions and, you know, frustrations around modern life as a trans person. But what I wanted to do was Spice Girls with X-Men and Witches. And it <laughs> felt like, well, why not do both? And really what ignited this novel was 
how would a coven, which by its definition, you know, is a coalition of women, how would my coven respond to the arrival of a young trans teenage witch? And from that point on, you know, it was like a snowball rolling downhill. The ideas just kept getting bigger and bigger. And, you know, this coven became my allegory for feminism, you know, and, you know, I'm surrounded by women, you know, my mum, my sister, my friends, my colleagues who have done nothing but support me. But I know there are women out there who are threatened and fearful of trans women. And I wanted to explore that. You know, it's, it's been good for me on a personal level as well. That's great. Well, I know that you've also written screenplays. How does your writing process differ between writing a screenplay versus a fantasy novel? Well, it's funny because to begin with, not much. So my first novel drafts tend to be very scripty. You know, I've always really loved writing dialogue. Mm -hmm. And it, it's what, in many ways, it's where I feel most comfortable. And, um, but, you know, for the longest time, I didn't write scripts because I thought you needed to go to special script school. Um, <laughs> I really did. Well, when actually, as soon as, you know, an, an agent said, we want you to have a go at writing, adapting one of your books, you know, it just came very easily because, you know, it's like writing a book, but without, <laughs> without all the prose and description. And, and so it kind of figures that I would, I would, swing from one to the other so like I said my first draft tend to be quite scripty and then on a second draft I go back and add a lot of the detail and description and the more prose based stuff hey this is Jeff host of the podcast you know sometimes it seems like there's just an infinite amount of information out there and that's exactly why I love Wondrium Wondrium is a streaming platform that offers thousands of programs and documentaries from respected experts who really know their stuff. And for the listeners of this podcast, Wondrium has a wide selection of writing resources, how to write best-selling fiction, how to publish your book, writing creative nonfiction, every day is a poem, how to create comics, and much, much more. And the best part, you can watch or listen anytime, anywhere with the Wondrium app. Download and watch or listen on the go. Explore all of your wonders with Wondrium, and your brain will love it. That's W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash B-O-O-K-S. Again, sign up today at wondrium.com slash books to get unlimited access with a 14-day free trial. Give it a try. If you are leading change, building a team, or implementing new procedures, Gonzaga University's online master's in organizational leadership gives you the tools for success. With concentrations in change, global, and servant leadership, you'll get the most relevant training and education to help you tackle any challenge. Visit gonzaga.edu slash leader and find out how Gonzaga's organizational leadership degree can affect positive change in your life and career. That's gonzaga.edu slash leader. That's interesting. Well, what was your original writing journey that led you to getting your first stories and novel published? If I if I can think back that far, it's been so long. <laughs> um, so now, so I have always written for as, lo as long as I as I can remember. Um, you know, before I even had a computer, I would just write down little stories in little notebooks. I would write them usually for an audience of one. That was my grandma. It's, <laughs> this sounds awful. It sounds like I'm throwing my family under a bus, but my family is just not a family of readers. And so I would produce these lovely little stories and nobody would care. Um, and, and so I would give them to my grandma and my grandma would read them. It's a lot of it was what we would now call fan fiction. I used to write little Doctor Who stories because I'm a lifelong Doctor Who fan. And, and it kind of started from there. But I, I didn't realize that, I didn't realize that, you know, normal working class queer people from Bradford, West Yorkshire could become authors. You know, the, the authors we were reading at school were largely dead. 
And like kind of from that kind of like British upper classes, you know, with the occasional the occasional American Harper Lee or John Steinbeck thrown in for good measure. So I didn't realize that people like me could actually get book deals. And so it was only when I was in my 20s and started to read young adult fiction, kind of I was borrowing books off the kids in my class. I used to be a primary school teacher that I realized, oh my gosh, some of these people are British and some of them (laughs) are working class people. And by then, of course, we had the wonderful internet. And I realized publishing is hard to get into, but not impossible. You know, there are ways in, there are agents and there are windows into this very closed world and so I just I I did my research and I wrote my first novel it was a YA book called Hollow Pike it's not available in America and never has been but um I was reading a lot of YA at the time and, and I always think that's the best place to start if you want to become a novelist which is you know read what else is out there kind of and and understand the marketplace and and you know, I, I was reading a lot of YA, but none of them, none of them had any queer characters. So I, I wrote my first book, which was like a paranormal fantasy about, about actually again, about witches. And, and that was how I got my first agent and then my first book deal. That's great. Well, do you have advice for writers who are working on their own stories, novels, or screenplays? Well, it's funny because now, you know, it's taken me a really, really long time. You know, I got my book deal in 2011 and it's taken me what 11 years to recognize something that I wish I had known from the beginning, which is, you know, you are your first reader, you know, and you can, nothing in this world is guaranteed. You can't guarantee a bestseller. You can't guarantee literary prizes. You can't guarantee getting a book dealer, a book agent, but you can try to amuse yourself. And with Her Majesty's Royal Coven, when I wasn't writing for the world, I was just writing to get myself through lockdown. I had the best time. And what people keep telling me about Her Majesty's Royal Coven is how much fun they had reading it. And I think that's because I had fun writing it. And do you know what? If This book had never got published. I would have still had the best time. And that's not nothing. And I've made a little vow to myself now that I'm not going to write another word that isn't for me. I'm not going to take on a script project that doesn't interest me. I'm not going to take on a commission that doesn't say something to me. I'm just going to write for myself. And if other people enjoy it, that's just a lovely bonus. That's great. Well, are you working on another novel now? Are you working on the second novel in the trilogy? So book two is done. I just last week sent the first draft off to my editors in both the UK and the US. So no doubt they will have something to say about that. I will. I await <laughs> their feedback. Um, and that's really lovely because I wanted to go into the promotional period for Her Majesty's Royal Coven with nothing hanging over me, kind of. So I imagine June and July are going to be pretty busy promoting this book. And then I will return to the writing table in September or October. And I'll start to think about book three, which is kind of making me sad because I love these characters so much that I'm not ready for it to end. And, you know, I had as much fun writing book two as I did writing book one. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite looking forward to the winter. It's going to be really nice to get back to it and spend one last novel with the characters. Well, what novels or nonfiction books have you read recently that you enjoyed? So during lockdown with it, I read a lot of nonfiction. Um, I I, I don't know why. I just was very taken by books like um, Men Who Hate Women by Laura Bates, which is about the rise of um, sort of the alt-right sort of Mennonist movement online, the incel movement, really, mm-hmm. really fascinating, really bleak read that I would recommend to anyone trying to understand um, misogynist hate crime better. Um, I'm so, so pleased Tori Peters' Detransition Baby came out last year as well. I think a lot of people expected me to write a book like Detransition Baby, which is a contemporary look at life as a trans woman. Um, I don't think people were expecting me to do a trilogy about witchcraft, but there you go. 
Um, and again, I think I've already mentioned it once, but Sean Fay's The Transgender Issue, which comes out in September in the United States, it is just the most perfectly complete analysis of trans rights in the world at the moment that I would say, check that one out. And an author, if you're not familiar with the author, Kieran Millwood Hargrave, um, I think she's very underappreciated. She's another British author who wrote a book called The Mercies, which is also about witches, but very different tonally to my book. But um, The Mercies is available now in the United States, and, and I think it deserved to make a much bigger splash. Well, where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about you and your novels? I am widely available on the internet, Jeff. Um, you can find me <laughs> at Juno Dawson on Instagram. And for now, Twitter, let's see what happens with Elon Musk. Let, let's, let's see how it goes. But yes, for now, I'm still on Twitter. That's great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Juno Dawson, author of the new novel, Her Majesty's Royal Coven. The novel is available now, so go buy a copy. And Juno, thanks for doing this interview. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Thanks a lot. Swing by JCPenney. The Black Friday and July deals are hot, hot, hot. Like $21.99 Arizona jeans and Home Expressions quick dry bath towels only $4.99. Get them while they last or check the JCP app for an extra 30% off coupon to use across the store. Buy online and pick up curbside to make life even easier. Shopping is back. JCPenney. Offers good on select styles through 724. Black Friday and July deals excluded from coupon. Conditions and exclusion supply. See store or jcp.com for details. Do it.